floor to, to open discussion. Um, so I'll let the speakers introduce themselves when they arrive. Um, so to get the ball rolling, I'd like to have a short rant about uh, greenwash, corporate greenwash. Now, we all know why we're here. Um, many of you would be all too familiar with the, the litany of, of nightmare visions which, which talking about climate change sort of brings. So I don't need to repeat them. But I mention only to remind us that, uh, of the seriousness of why we're here um, and, and what we call this climate catastrophe. Uh, so hopefully this should sharpen our minds uh, and give us the determination to really do something about this. Um, a determination which I hope actually stays with us when we're on the streets in Copenhagen this winter because uh, we're going to need that. Um, given the gravity of this situation, it's still really quite surprising uh, how cynical corporate power can be. Um, now I'm sure you've seen these Coca-Cola ads all over town. Copenhagen. Uh, Coca-Cola is of course famed for its marketing power and it sees this opportunity um, to source new heights of irony. Uh, the bottle icon, this ball, has been a symbol of capitalism for well over a generation. Um, and this Christmas they're rebranding it as the bottle of hope. Copenhagen. Coca-Cola is quick to remind us of its green credentials. However, we do know better. We know about the union assassinations in Colombia. We know about water depletion in, and toxic waste in India. And we know about the huge climate impact that producing these cans, transporting them around, and refrigerating them causes. So we know that Coca-Cola is very responsible for environmental destruction. <coughs> business nationally and internationally so it's definitely a, uh, an opportunity for people certain people to make quite a lot of money um, it's also an opportunity to back up uh, capitalism's kind of image crisis um, at the time of um, financial crisis and a crisis at home in the UK it's an opportunity to spin some narrative of attempting to do something that's going to improve the world but it's also as I would argue an opportunity for us for us to remake the world in a fundamentally different way and not just to use the um, kind of totalizing problem of urgency to act on climate change as a way of shutting down all other forms of politics. I don't see any fundamental contradiction between taking urgent action um, on the climate crisis and simultaneously taking equally urgent action on transforming the world to a society not based on um, a capitalist mode of production, constant accumulation, which ultimately is at the root of um, these crises anyway. Um, and I think at the COP, um, here you can see the sort of um, manifestation of a sort of form of Copenhagen from above and Copenhagen from below. I don't think it's split as easy as that. There are obviously people inside the <coughs> summit that re represent uh, the above, and um, there are going to be people on the streets that you can see representing the below. But I think within that, there's a kind of tension within movements, within groups, and within individuals as well, over, um, over how they articulate a radical critique of the system within an environmental politics that sees that we need to take um, action as urgently as possible. Um, and I think you can also see this, um, this above and below as a form of um, value struggle between the values of those that um, valorise constant profit and um, seeing this as an opportunity to continue the system that's got us here and the values of others of us that see that the world should be based on a fundamentally different value system um, and that this leads to a kind of a value struggle and I think that's what we, that's what we need and that's what we can see sort of occurring um, a, a struggle over a different way of life which for me would be um, if we see the, the COP as part of a, a restructuring process, as some kind of move maybe towards some kind of more socially just or more green capitalism, that that ultimately is going to be based on some new round of accumulation, a new round of enclosure, a new round of enclosure of things that previously potentially we've held in common or haven't been part of private property. And I think as a kind of counter to that, um, in, instead of maybe arguing against the very neoliberal free market idea of capitalism towards some more um, socially just, social democratic capitalism that owns these things in the public sphere, we should get rid of the public private and um, start to think about how 
actually the world is part of our commonwealth and that we need to extend these commons and struggle over these commons and produce new ones as part of our, our value struggles and for a new way of life and to um, fundamentally challenge the way we live now as part of fighting the climate crisis and be very careful about how much we reinforce the kind of dominant narrative of how they would like to um, re-administer the world and put some of their full solutions forward. Um, yeah, and that's, that's all I've kind of prepared, but hopefully we can have a discussion based on the next points. Um, I think Chicago is <coughs> next up. Um, yes, I'm sorry I'm a bit late now. I kind of feel like I'm not entirely sure what has already been said. Hey, I'm happy. Come, come and give us your spiel. Well, you still have my spiel. I'm supposed to do now. <laughs> Um, okay, um, right. Yeah, sorry for being, being late. There was a, a CJA press conference where some stuff needed to be done. Hi, um, I'm Tadjo. Um, I'm involved with CJA and have been since the beginning of the mobilization. And um, I guess, I hope, please stop me if I'm uh, duplicating things. and. As you will soon notice, I'm also completely hyperactive, so stop me if I speak too fast. That can very easily happen. I'll sort of get up and start ranting, so just too fast, or if I'm, make me calm down. Okay, um, what I was going to be speaking about for a few minutes was, um, I, I'm going to try and put in a way what you had said into the kind of concrete context, the critique of green capitalism <coughs> into the context of what's actually happening inside the COP. So I'm not sure how much you've kind of talked about that. Because there's sort of the idea that, you know, there's a political legitimation crisis of capitalism right now. Basically, people don't really like capitalism at this point. It's kind of gotten a bit of an image issue at this point. The same applies for institutions of national governance. You know, parties are becoming less and less popular, membership rates are decreasing, voting rates are decreasing across the board. So there is this kind of political crisis of legitimation. Um, so I might stand up because there's also this annoying hole right here. Um, there, is, there is a second crisis, an economic crisis, which is a, sort of partly a crisis of overaccumulation. You have all this capital sloshing around that can't really go anywhere productive. You can't really invest it productively because there isn't any very sort of sexy, exciting technological driver of growth. And at the same time, people have had very low wages for about 30 years as a result of the neoliberal offensive. That means lots of stuff produced, not enough people who have purchasing power. That means too much capital that can't be profitably invested. That leads to financialization and the crisis of overaccumulation. That was just like a 30 second political economy of a crisis of overaccumulation. But those are the two things that are happening right now. And at the same time, there is not just a climate crisis, there is a wider ecological crisis that you might call the bio crisis. Right? You have a crisis of desertification, uh, crisis of water access, crisis of food, crisis of biodiversity, and all these various crises arise from the contradiction or the antagonism, the tension that exists between capital's need for infinite growth and the fact that we live on a finite <coughs> planet. So what I was going to say, kind of, I was going to try and take these various macro crisis phenomena and show how they're reflected inside the COP process. Because when we've now had, this is COP 15, right? So there have been 14 years of COPs. And when we started our mobilization, people were fairly critical of our more rejectionist position vis-a-vis -vis the COP. They said, look, you know, you can't attack the COP. It's, the, it's not the WTO, it's not the IMF. They're the nice guys, right? It's the UN. They wear the nice blue hats and, you know, they're the good guys. Now, I think in the last year we've seen that our critique from the more radical wing of the movement has really been borne out. Right? And it's not just been borne out by the fact that it's absolutely sure that there won't be a good deal in COP. I just, maybe i stop for a moment. Does anybody in this movement, in this room, believe that there will be a good deal coming out of Copenhagen? Yeah. 